Are we set to go? Do I start? We're ready for you to go. Oh, okay. good. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Pakula. I'm the treasurer of Gray Muzzle. Um, brief, welcome, first of all. Um, we're excited to have everyone here. Um, briefly um, about myself, just to introduce myself to the, to the group here. Uh, I'm a CPA in the Chicago area with about 25 years of financial management experience. Um, I've been involved with Gray Muzzle for almost three years. I was first introduced to Gray Muzzle um, in an indirect manner about three years ago. I'm also involved with the Illinois CPA Society and had noticed that Gray Muzzle had uh, placed an ad in the, in the job board there for a part-time finance director. And just the, the name Gray Muzzle struck out to me because not too long before that, we had lost our senior dog. And I kind of had an idea by the name what the organization did. So um, I looked them up and uh, thought this is really an organization I would love to be involved with because of the mission uh, that we have. And so I contacted one of the board members that was listed with this, the CPA Society. And we talked, my goal was originally to kind of volunteer my time for that finance director position so that they can use the funds towards the dogs. And just in further discussions with them, um, it was decided maybe I would be a good fit for the board. Um, so I decided to join the board then and became treasurer shortly thereafter. And I think it all worked out well because I, as we continue to grow that finance director position, I think has become more important and working more hours. And we were able to find a really good person to fit that role. So everything um, has seemed to work out really well. Um, so, and basically just my time with the board and, and hearing such great stories, not only from everyone, the board members and and our, our lives with animals and just the, the, the rescues and who we're involved with and the stories of the animals that are being saved is just, it's really a kind of a, a great part of my day um, after working something I like to do work in finance and accounting, but it's great to spend time with the board members and the people and hear the stories and just talk about our goals and everything that we're doing. Um, for those that are, aren't quite familiar with Gray Muzzle, um, basically, I'm going to read a little bit of this, um, just so you, you know I'm reading uh, off my sheet here. But our mission is, is to improve the lives of at-risk dogs by providing funding and resources to animal shelters, rescue organizations, sanctuaries, and other nonprofit groups nationwide. Um, and in fact, currently, we are in the process of reviewing our 2023 grant for our grant rewards we're doing the applications and we'll be um probably awarding close to eight hundred thousand uh, dollars in the next few months um based on the applications that we received um and we are um actually one of the only national organizations dedicated specifically to the health and well-being of senior dogs so i actually feel really um uh, honored to be a part of that process and seeing the work that everyone at gray muzzle does um, and that's actually why I'm here, excited to be a part of the webinar series today. Um, and that gives me an opportunity to introduce our, our guest speaker, Helen St. Pierre. She is the owner of Old Dogs Go to Helen um, and also head trainer at No Monkey Business Dog Training in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, Helen is certified in many disciplines of training, including certified professional dog trainer and licensed and certified family dog mediator. I mean, before we started the webinar, we were kind of talking about that, that that is in reviewing Helen's bio, that's something that really stood out to me was, I think just the, the certified family dog mediator, because I think every animal, especially dog owner at some point or another, um, would really, I think on both sides, I think they, they can see it in sometimes their pet's eyes that, you know what, mediation would not be a bad idea here. And I think we've all felt that, that at some point, a mediator would be helpful um, with, our, with our stubborn animals at times. So, um, I don't know if Helen's going to have a chance to talk about that certification during this webinar, but hopefully if not, we can invite her back to talk more about that. Um, so anyway, Helen has been featured on radio and print television for her work. Um, and I also urge you to visit the, or her organization's website at nonmonkeybusinessdogtraining.com. Um, and with all that said, I'm happy to introduce to you Helen St. Pierre. Helen. Hi, Jim. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be back again. 
Um, so I, I really appreciate everybody joining us today. And today I'm going to be talking about something that um, is actually a subject quite close to my heart for our senior and hospice uh, dogs that we share our lives with, and that is anxiety. Um, and, you know, that increase that we might see in our senior and um, hospice animals that we have with us. A little bit of background of where I'm coming from when I speak about this. I am a certified professional dog trainer, certified dog behavior consultant. And, um, and uh, as you were saying, Jim, a certified family dog mediator, also licensed in behavior in that division as well. Um, and so a lot of the information that I talk about when I talk about anxiety and fears based on our progressive information that we're gathering um, almost on a daily basis at this point when it comes to behavior, but also through my own personal experiences. Um, I started working with shelter and rescue animals. It was my my very first um, real in the thick of it job was working at a very high kill shelter out in Colorado. Um, and so I've sort of been in the thick of, of rescue and shelter work for my entire 21 year career. Uh, but especially in dealing with my uh, sanctuary for my senior dogs, um, anxiety is something that we see quite frequently. And it's unfortunately something that we tend to focus very heavily on when we're dealing with younger animals, but we don't have enough research, enough uh, information, and I think enough proactive knowledge being put out to the public with senior dogs on um, alleviating and understanding where some of that anxiety comes from. So, um, you know, first and foremost, before we, we talk about what um, that is, you know, what, what it looks like, we have to define, like, what is anxiety, right? What is anxiety and fear? So unfortunately, anxiety and fear tends to be um, thrown around a lot as a, you know, what we call a construct. Oh, my dog is anxious, but anxious doesn't actually tell us anything about what's going on. So many clients will call me and say, my dog is very anxious. He didn't used to be anxious before. And I will say to them, well, what does anxious look like? Tell me what that is. So anxiety can present itself in multiple ways. We can see physical signs of anxiety, things like shaking, panting, um, inability or not wanting to eat the, um, like they used to. Uh, drooling, uh, dilated pupils, increased respiratory rate. Um, you know, we'll see dogs that sometimes just cannot settle, some dogs that are hiding. Those are some of the physical things that we'll see. And then some of the mental things that we'll see will be, you know, inability to focus, not being able to, um, you know, regulate themselves the way that they are not able to calm down, maybe not as responsive to certain things that they used to be, you know, so that's to me when someone says, you know, my dog is anxious, and then they start describing, well, he, you know, he heard the fire alarm, and he starts, he started pacing a lot, and he's drooling, that definitely is a physical sign of the, so those kinds of anxiety symptoms. And what can be very distressing for many of us in the, um, you know, with, in the senior dog world is seeing our dogs go from no anxiety, dogs that don't, don't have never displayed anxiety to suddenly beginning to develop that anxiety and then seeing that anxiety sometimes get worse. Um, one such form of anxiety that we tend to do, we do see a lot more in, in senior dogs is sound sensitivity. Uh, sound sensitivity tends to be something that uh, can absolutely get worse as a dog gets older. Um, and there are many theories on why this happens. Um, what's really interesting, if you follow any of Dr. Nicholas Dodman's work on sound sensitivity at Tufts, is that we found that, um, you know, in our ears, in in and this goes for dogs' ears and most mammals' ears, we have tiny, tiny hairs that are in our ear tubes, right? That sort of help us process all of those sounds. And one theory is that as we get older, those tiny hairs don't pro they they get thinner. There there aren't as many of them, and so we may hear sounds or not hear sounds the same way that we used to when we were younger. And that can actually start to increase a little anxiety when we hear something unpredictable or loud that we don't process the same way we used to. Now, what can happen there, if, especially if it's unpredictable, is unpredictability with the sounds such as the fire alarm. When a fire alarm goes off for us, we go, oh, it was the fire alarm. Something must have created smoke that made that fire alarm go off. But for our dogs, our dogs don't go, oh, that loud noise. 
someone burned the toast again, okay? They don't know that. They just know they were taking a nap and suddenly out of nowhere, a very loud, very scary noise occurred. Um, and that unpredictability can create a great deal of anxiety for our dogs because then they feel that they can't or don't understand where or when that could potentially happen again. Most large and loud sounds to us, again, are predictable. Thunderstorms, when we see that lightning come and we know the thunderstorm is coming, we can predict most likely we're going to hear some loud noises. But to dogs, they don't have that same level of prediction. Same with fireworks, same with even snow falling off our roof. We can't rationalize that. So that unpredictability can create some anxiety. And what ends up happening with many dogs, and especially we see this with senior dogs, is the prediction of potential unpredictability, right? So something might happen. So therefore I'm going to be anxious about it before it even happens. And for some reason, for many senior dogs, this tends to um, spiral into multiple sound sensitivities. So at first it was just the fire alarm. Then it's the microwave beeping. Then it is, um, you know, you dropped a, a pan on the floor by accident. And these sound sensitivity things can really, really start to build. Now, what's really interesting with that kind of sound sensitivity for, for senior dogs is that we know that it can also be linked sometimes to, um, to pain, to feeling discomfort. And how many of us it, with our senior dogs know that a lot of the times we are treating underlying disease or pain for a lot of our dogs. And sometimes we're doing it proactively, right? So we see our dogs maybe a little bit sore, getting up, trying to move, and we go, okay, I'm going to start treating you with an NSAID or something like that. And we've actually found in some of our research that um, that, that kind of discomfort can increase anxiety, which can therefore increase more sound sensitivity. So it's no wonder then that we see some of this really start to increase as we get to seniorhood um, and even hospicehood with some of these dogs where um, as their body starts to get uh, deteriorate more, their anxiety can peak also with that as well. Now, sound sensitivity is one form of anxiety. A few things that I definitely have seen in my hospice sanctuary is confinement or isolation anxiety tends to increase in senior dogs um, as they age. Uh, we all have this idea that a lot of senior dogs just like to nap all day and they could care less if you get up and go to the grocery store. They're happy to sleep, you know, that kind of thing. But for many of my clients and for my own senior dogs in my sanctuary, that's actually the opposite. Um, the more they age and the more infirm and frail they get, the less secure they feel by themselves. Um, and this kind of goes back to some of my senior dog talk that I was talking about with multi-dogs when I discussed how sometimes having multiple senior dogs at the same time can be extremely comforting for those dogs and alleviating that anxiety. Uh, but where is that coming from? Well, I have some theories on that in, in where some of that anxiety can come from. And I think it a lot of it boils down to um, when we're dealing with aging, when we deal with um, animals that are no longer as capable or able to do things that they used to, when I look at my um, sheet, so I have a, a sheet that I look at for each of my senior dogs, and I look at something called purpose, joy, and function. So three, those are three things that I'm constantly looking at for my senior dogs. Purpose is, does my dog have purpose, right? Is, is that senior dog still enjoying purpose? And purpose can be something as simple as going for a walk or smelling the ground or digging up something or eating, right? Like purpose for me is definitely eating. Like that's something I really enjoy. Um, joy is something that they enjoy doing? What do they find joy in? Now, can joy and purpose merge together? Absolutely, but they can also be separate. So for some of my senior dogs, joy is like lying in a sunny spot, right? Their purpose is they love to go on a walk, but laying in a sunny spot is where they find joy. And then function. How is that animal functioning? Are they eating well? Are they sleeping well? All of that stuff. Um, are they walking and moving, able to function their bodies well? What happens as we age, not just our animals, but as we age, is those things shift, right? 
um, I may be able to find more purpose, uh, still have purpose, but my function may sometimes um, alter my ability to have that purpose. Like I'm not able to climb a mountain at the age I'm at now the same way and, and bounce back from it, <laughs> right? The same way I would have when I was in my early 20s, okay? Like early 20s, sure, you know, I could go all day, hike, no problem, that kind of thing. Now, after a full day with the kids, not even doing too much, for, I'm exhausted, like I'm tired. And that changes, my purpose may have changed and my function may be changing too. And that can actually be quite anxiety producing for a lot of dogs when they are no a no longer able to do or, or perform certain things the way that they used to be able to. And that can cause anxiety and stress. And it's something that we don't think or talk about enough in terms of alleviating that. So an example of this, a very, very simple example of this is going up and down sets of stairs. How many of us with our senior dogs have sets of stairs that our dogs want to come up and join us with, right? They come up at the end of the night and they want to come with us. Well, if that's a purpose for them and a joy that they enjoy, if their function, their body is getting tired, their legs are, are, are sore or their back end is sore, that their inability and their function may be affecting their ability to have that purpose to go upstairs. And so we've seen, I've seen many, many dogs get extremely anxious in evening time because they're preemptively understanding they want to go upstairs, but they're no longer able to do that the same way they used to, or they're able to do it, but now not without feeling what? Pain right? And that that can cause anxiety. Now, we will then see symptoms of that anxiety maybe crop up in other ways. In that evening period, you might see your dog start pacing more, right? They are already preemptively feeling anxious because they know bedtime's coming and they're not going to be able to perform that basic function um, and that kind of thing. I see the same thing with uh, getting up and down on the couch. Many of us, I'm sure, have seen our senior dogs try to jump up on the couch a few times and then they 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 do it finally. Um, and we're like, oh, yay. But we don't realize that that process of being unable to do it the first time now may be actually causing some anxiety for our dogs that they're unable to perform that function the way that they used to be. So something that we need to focus on a lot with our senior dogs in alleviating that is being able to recognize as their function begins to change and they're unable to do certain things the way that they used to be able to, we can help alleviate that anxiety by giving them the ability to do the function better. For example, ramps, right? You should see the ramps and the stairs I have all over my house to get up and down on couches or for example, on my hardwood floors, when I see that my dogs are starting to lose a little bit of their traction and their function may be changing, we bring out the yoga mats or the nice big rugs so that that dog is able to perform the functions that they used to be able to and feel that purpose and joy without worrying or creating anxiety and stress. Does that make sense? This is really important things to start considering. And the sooner you do it, the sooner you start alleviating that anxiety and it actually doesn't tend to spiral. Things for going up and down stairs, this is when I tend to go to, um, you know, I have a lot of clients that will have this with, with the stairs. I'll go to uh, sticky floor stick-ons that you can put onto your stairs. I'll also, if we're having vision changes, so vision, hearing, um, and smell changes, as those start to deteriorate, those basic functions, that can definitely increase anxiety. Imagine being able to see where you were going with no problem, and now suddenly you can't, and you still want to do the things that you used to be able to do, but you are definitely more hindered. So alleviating things visually for dogs that are having some detriment can be something as simple as putting painter's tape along the edge of your stairs so that your dog can see, oh, okay, now I have a much more defined space of where I know my steps are, okay? Um, or putting like sticky things on. Or sometimes, and this is a conversation that I had in a, an online course I was teaching um, earlier this year, was starting to think, well, if I can see that his back end is going out and he's not going to have as easy a time going to sleep in our bedroom anymore, maybe I should start acclimating my dog to sleeping downstairs so that as he gets older, that anxiety is not going to be increased by me going upstairs, him, him unable to come with me. 
and feeling incredibly anxious throughout the night, right? So starting to think ahead of time of what we can do. I remember when my father was building my grandmother a house, um, an in-law apartment right onto, um, right next to our house when she had fallen ill and he built an upstairs, but very cleverly, he, he built a downstairs bedroom as well, which he could to call the dining room. But he said to me, he pulled me aside and he said, yes, but when she can no longer do stairs, this will be her bedroom. And I thought, what a great idea, because we can transition her to that before she can no longer get up and down the stairs. And I think more the more that we proactively make those kinds of decisions and start thinking about that for our senior dogs, the more we can alleviate those anxiety situations from occurring. So if we go back to that isolation and confinement anxiety, I do think that a lot of that can come from the inability to have that purpose, joy, and function in the same way, um, in combination with sort of just the unknown. Um, a lot of senior dogs can struggle with, well, um, what's, what's going to happen next? Um, so I really try very hard to create routine as best as I can for my senior dogs. Sometimes I find that that helps them um, immensely. Now, routine can be something as simple as making the environment a little bit more predictable and smaller, not confining to a crate, but saying, you know what, I'm not going to give you the living room, kitchen, sunroom, dining room, all of that. You're dealing with a little bit of cognitive issues there where you tend to get lost. I'm just going to give you the living room from now on, buddy. And that way you don't have so much space that you have to navigate through. And giving that kind of routine and sort of structure can help these anxious dogs quite a bit um, in alleviating some of that. The other thing that I absolutely implement with my older dogs um, as I start to see them get a little bit more anxious is white noise or sound machines. Um, I love the sound machines that either play just the plain white noise, it sounds like a box fan, or um, even just lullabies or classical music. We know from our studies of the way that dogs um, process music is that single instrument classical music is much more therapeutic to them than like Beethoven's fifth. OK, so like Chopin or Bach or something like that, that you're playing that is very sort of one level sounds can be very, very helpful for them during that period of like being alone um, and creating that predictable environment. And then I'm a huge fan of using scent therapy as well. Lavender, um, you know, there's all kinds of herbal um, flower essences that you can put onto things that can help, again, create that predictability. Um for many of my senior dogs, when I'm dealing with anxiety that is also due to fear or pain, um, I love my heating pad station. So I have my nice big blanket heated pad station right there next to the white noise machine in a really nice routine space where they have direct access to food and water. And that really alleviates the anxiety. The hard part is, is that when we've had a dog for 11 years that has never had needed those things, it's hard to branch away from that. Well, what do you mean? I, he's all, his food's always been in the kitchen. Why do I need to change that? Why do I need to now move and change his whole environment around? And it's the same reason that we have to change our environments when we have a puppy. Then they live with us through adulthood and we have to change their environments as they go through the end of their life as well. And again, we do this for people. And the more that we think proactively about that, the more we can alleviate a lot of those anxiety symptoms and issues. Um, the last part of anxiety that I can definitely see more with dogs, um, senior dogs is body handling issues um, and restraint. Um, and I think that basically, I think a lot of that boils down to um, pain and discomfort and the potential of pain and discomfort. Um, very recently, I had a dog who's the sweetest kind of, he's blind and he's deaf and he's 15. Um, and he's so kind and sweet, but he has terrible teeth. Um, and he ended up having an abscess in his mouth that I had to have surgically removed, Mr. Fletcheroo. Um, he's so sweet. But um, prior to that, I was really struggling with like, this is a dog that I've always been able to handle and brush out. He's a Shih Tzu mix. So I'm always, and he was like giving me such a hard time. And I've had him since last year. Um, and that was when I was like, something's not right. And I took him to the vet and sure enough, we found that he had a tooth abscess. So um, it may not necessarily be anxiety or behavior. It can a lot of the times with these older dogs be 
fully linked into uh, physical stuff. And that's why it's really, really good to have a vet that does what I call toe to tail exams on these guys. If you start to see anxiety change, um, you know, in any way, shape or form, let's check their blood work. Let's make sure that their liver and their kidneys are doing okay. Let's make sure that um, they don't have any teeth issues or an ear infection that's sort of sitting there underlying because that absolutely can increase that. Oh my God. Okay. I've talked your ear off for a half an hour. Um, so now I can get open up. What I'd love to do is open up for some questions, particular cases of anxiety or anything else that you would like to ask. Jim, do you have anything? I actually, uh, Helen, thank you. I, I do. And, and so actually so many questions just listening to you, but, and one of the things that stood out from having, you know, as our dogs age, and I guess it's maybe a, a two-part question is, are there levels of anxiety as our dogs get older? And then secondly, and I think more importantly is because I think the most times I've seen my dog anxious was of course with sounds, fireworks, or say a smoke detector, as you said, secondly is going to the vet. And as they get older, I think there's more trips to the vet. And we were you know, so fortunate to the vets that we had worked with over time were so, I mean, not only is this very, very good at, at what they did, but just you could tell how much they cared about our dog and, and presented themselves that way to be as gentle as possible. So is there something that we should look for even when we're with, as our dogs get older and, and taking them to the vet and, and what to look for in that vet who's treating them to help reduce their anxiety while they're in you know, the exam room or on the way to the exam. Cause yes. you know, it'd be funny. Our, our dog knew within probably two or three blocks of, of the uh, vet's yes. office that they started shaking. And so that was, yeah. Is there any advice there? Because we all go through that and it seems to increase as they get older. And, and that puts a lot of, I think, stress on our, our pets. Well, yeah. And I think it's really important to understand too, that anxiety and tension when your body is older, um, feels a lot different, right? If you're dealing with an extremely arthritic dog that gets anxious and then starts shaking and gets tense, that that makes them sore. So they're even feeling sore prior to getting to the vet because they're all tense. So, you know, working with a vet who is extremely empathetic about that is important. And that's also where I will have discussions with my vet about, I am pre-treating this dog prior to bringing him to the vet for anxiety, right? I'm going to pre-treat with, you know, sometimes a lot of vets are very comfortable with like gabapentin. Gabapentin is a wonderful pain reliever for many dogs because it's not an NSAID but it does have anti-anxiety uh, qualities to it as well. So some vets will say, well, give him twice the amount of gabapentin before the vet visit, and maybe even add a, um, an anti-anxiety, something like trazodone, half a dose of that, just so he feels better for the initial visit. I think working with certified fear-free vets is really good as well. Finding vets that are as hands-free as possible. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that they avoid the exam, but they really avoid doing heavy duty restraint or a very comfortable good doing, um, letting you hold the animal. Um, I think for our senior dogs, um, it's even more important that they feel that the person that they're extremely bonded with and trust is right there with them. Um, so having a vet that is very comfortable with you holding the dog while they do the exam or examine can be can be really effective. But pre-treatment um, and even post-anxiety treatment for the vet visit can be really effective, Jim. Does that answer your question? It does. I, and I appreciate that. And that's, I, I have further questions and I will save those for maybe another webinar just because I know others I'm sure have many questions but that does um, thank you because that, that's that's a concern I think for all of us so yeah that, yeah that answers absolutely it well. Helen somebody asked that. what would you recommend for dogs losing their hearing oh um as much predictability as you possibly can for dogs losing their hearing you know <laughs> it's really funny because half of my hospice dogs are deaf and half of them I just feel like don't want to hear me <laughs> like right. um some of them absolutely are like yeah I can hear her I'm not coming inside right, right now. get it that's where we need that um, mediator yeah, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just gonna pretend right like Rosie is definitely deaf so uh, losing hearing losing sight is anxiety producing right because you no longer are able to feel predictable about what's happening and what you are hearing. What, what if you're not hearing that? Or, I mean, that, that happened to me when I went for my glasses, I will never forget when I first put my prescription on and I was like, Oh my God, this whole time I haven't been seeing things properly the way that I should have been seeing them. Um, and then knowing that without them, 
I'm not functioning the way as, as well as I could. So predictability is really important. And sometimes for our deaf dogs or for our blind dogs, that's when I would recommend um, looking into even like one of the really nice help them up harnesses or harnesses with a um, a nice little uh, handle on the back or something that you can clip a leash to that you can start um, combining a little bit of visual signaling for the dog. Like, hey, when we come in and I'm gonna give you a little tug, that means to come inside. And it also will reduce your anxiety because if your dog is doesn't have a fenced in yard or even if you do have a fenced in yard and they just wander off, um, so helping create predictability and routine, you know, um, I think that's, that's quite hard too, when you're preparing food and you've always had a dog that's heard the food go into the dish and come running. And now you have a deaf dog who can't hear that. So you may have to go find them and shake the bowl in front of them. And so can you smell this? Come with me. We're going to go over here. Um, so just alleviating it as best as you can and helping create new routines. So routines are going to change and become a different type of predictable for the dog when they start to lose those basic functions. Great it's question. It's interesting that you phrase it that way because someone else just asked about their dog went blind and mm. ever since they've gone blind, they have huge separation anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Um, any suggestions for overnight wakefulness with anxiety? Overnight wakefulness, like waking up in the middle of the night and pacing type stuff? Yes, I would assume so. Yes. So um, it's very common for a lot of anxiety to sometimes happen in the evenings with our senior dogs. Now, one of that can be something called sundowning. We know that our um, serotonin levels are much lower in the evening than they are in the morning. And so sometimes with our senior pets, we need to, as they get older, help supplement them more for in the evening and help them get longer levels or longer hours of sleep. That can be talking to your veterinarian. You know, melatonin is a phenomenal um, supplement that can help a lot. Although some of the research that we have on melatonin says that sometimes you need up to three times the dose that you think you need to actually affect the dog. But that would be having that conversation with your vet and saying, I think I'm dealing with some, you know, evening and, and nighttime anxiety. My dog isn't sleeping the same as they used to be. That function is definitely off. And um, working with the vet sometimes can, can help with that. Um, if you're noticing pacing, you know, one of our old ways of thinking was we'll confine the dog, you know, and I've had some separate or some anxiety dogs at night that I, I, have always let them out. They've always slept in the same room and all of that. But when they start to pace, something that you can try is saying, okay, I'm going to create a little pen now for you as an older dog. You're going to stay in a pen next to the bed and see if that alleviates the dog's ability to work themselves into a lather. Something that we have to understand with anxiety is anxiety can feed anxiety that feeds anxiety. So what relieves the animal of anxiety, such as pacing, can then feed the anxiety even more and create more pacing. So sometimes we have to shut that down. Um, obviously, if your dog gets really stressed in that confinement, then we we can't do that. We're going to have to talk to the vet about giving them something that helps them settle. But that's a great question. Okay, go ahead. Hit me with more. Thanks. I'm, yeah, we are getting so many questions. These are great. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pick a variety of everything to cover everybody's needs. So. Yes. Um, another question, how would you suggest dealing with an increase of fear and anxiety around male family members? Our senior had always been mostly comfortable around men, though mostly preferred females. But after <clears throat> our other senior passed, he seemed to have regressed and shows more fear around men. Okay, so their other senior dog passed. So that would be, again, that that um, change in the environment, that dynamic, when, when a senior dog and another senior dog have sort of like grown up together or they've got a buddy and then that that friend has passed, right. we absolutely can see an, in, an upkick in what typically the dog wasn't very comfortable with before. They are now extremely uncomfortable with because they no longer have a support system to lean on. So a lot of the times we then have to create that support system. Like I will be your support system. But what we really recommend for whether it's senior dogs or any dog is creating predictable patterns. So when these men come over, this is where you're going to go and hang out. When these men are here, I'm going to give you this and this is where you'll be. And taking that pressure off, our instinct is to fix it. 
you know, if I just have the men feed the dog enough treats, or if I just do this, this don't just say, I get it, buddy. I'm going to put you away over here. Okay. Like I get that you don't like it. I'm going to be your support system. And I will tell you, you're fine. Hang out over here. Um, you know, and again, if, if the anxiety is so chronic that it's affecting the dog's ability to have function, purpose, and joy, then we have to talk to the vet about treating that. Uh, but, um, you know, I would give the dog a predictable place to go and not try to fix it, cr- create some different predictability. Great question. Right. Okay. A question from Facebook. I'm seeing an increase in unprovoked startle responses in my girl. She'll just jump out of complete resting state or sleep as if something has happened, but nothing in her external environment has occurred. Is there anything I can do to help her with this? Oh, that's great. I would definitely talk to the vet about some cognitive things. Make sure that there's no sort of, you know, it's it's like startling or she could be hearing things. That's when we're dreaming and we hear something and we wake up. Um, And there are all kinds of really cool cognitive um, and, you know, uh, brain supplements that we can give our animals now. Like there's even specific foods that we've developed for senior dogs that um, I'm still waiting on a lot more of the studies on this stuff, but there are a lot of options out there to offer support during sleep. So what you're seeing there is that the dog's sleep cycle is being interrupted. Um, So that again is that basic function. So we may have to look at, okay, do we need to add something in and see if this treats it? The hardest thing for me, um, and this is definitely personally with my senior sanctuary, is when I'm treating things like that, when I can't ask the dog, I can't go, what, are you hearing something? Is it a, is it a a pain reflex? Like is, is some, a muscle in your system twitching that's waking you up? So then we have to do something called diagnosis through treatment where we may go, all right, well, maybe it's, um, you know, some cognitive things. So let's treat you so that maybe you're sleeping a little better. Let's do some melatonin. If the behavior is still occurring there, then we could say, Maybe it's a a pain response to a nerve that's, you know, going off or something. Let's give her some pain medicine before she, you know, trying these things. And sometimes that's the only way that we really figure it out. The point is, is um, not giving up and and having a vet that is willing to sort of play whack-a-mole with you until you're able to actually find that. Um, And then there's always, of course, there's always going to be those cases where you're like, I don't know, it's just, they're just older. And I was like my mother, I'm like, well, that's just mom now because she's older. But, um, but if it's affecting their basic day-to-day functions, then don't stop until you find something that offers them a little bit of relief. Thank you for those answers. Um, There's a few others in regards to pain that I'm looking through and also um, CBD and hemp treats. Do you have suggestions on the use of CBD and or hemp treats? That was a great question. So CBD and hemp um, is a, is an avenue that I am still waiting for a lot of research on before I start actively recommending it across the board. Um, I am not a veterinarian. I don't want to be a veterinarian. Their jobs are hard enough as it is. I stick to my little behavior corner, but um, you know, I, I do recommend supplements that we know and do have research on is actually helping. One such one is like tryptophan or L-theanine, vitamin B12, chamomile. I mean, we have a lot of research on that. So there are, um, you know, the, the cool research that we do have is that a lot of the serotonin that we use in our brain is made in the gut right? And that the diet and supplements like that can absolutely help our brain um, and how it produces and works properly. Um, CBD and hemp treats, the main issue I have with those is it was sort of like a the floodgates opened and every place and every different brand came out with all these different CBD options or hemp treat options. Have I had clients try them and have great success? Absolutely. But I don't have enough yet in hand to really say whether or not it is um, absolutely effective. But I will say you can file it under the category of can't hurt, might help, right? Um, If it makes a difference, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, But if it doesn't make a difference, the, the nice thing is, is it's very unlikely if you use it as directed in that thing, it's that it's going to do any long term potential damage, it doesn't stay in the system for a long period of time. So can't hurt might help if you, if it works wonderful. Um, and if, if my thing is, if you continue to use it, make sure you're getting it from a reputable source. If that answers that question. 
Yes, I think that certainly does answer that question. Um, there's a question about helping a dog navigate daily walks mm. where the owner suspects the dog could be losing some depth perception. And I think that's causing anxiety with just, well, I mean, we talked a little bit about blindness earlier, but maybe could you relate it to being outside, taking walks, perhaps where things are less predictable than in your house where you can yep. create that safe space or that routine um how would you what would you suggest for walks with the outside stimulus well i think that depends on the dog in many ways uh, uh, in terms of does the dog still find joy in the walk and purpose in the walk or are we still thinking that the dog needs that right so that may be where we need to shift our perspective of you know this dog is losing its sight or its function is now changing and maybe the walk is not the way that the dog would prefer to get their exercise or physical activity or if we do it we're going to do it in a very predictable way so you know none of my hospice dogs get walked but they have their yard that they go out in and it's very predictable so as they're losing their sight they all know the feeling of the ramp the feeling of the rocks they know how to find the feeling of the ramp back up to the rocks and all of that it's all very designated um but if i'm if i have a dog that is still enjoying and had, finds purpose in the walks and and that kind of thing i can have volunteers walk that dog but we stay in a very predictable pattern we go from this spot to this spot to this spot and back again and that's that um because again that predictability is really really important i think to alleviate that anxiety so it depends on the dog. If the dog is still enjoying walks, create incredible predictability for the walk. Now, whether that means that like you make it almost like a scent trail. Okay. We walk to the mailbox, you get a cookie. We walk to this mailbox, you get a cookie. We walk to this patch of grass, you get five minutes to smell and do that. And then we go back to that mailbox cookie, next mailbox cookie, and then we're home. And you, you create that predictability and the dog's like, oh, I know this route now. We walk to the mailbox, there's my cookie. Now I know which way to go for this cookie. And it, that will help. Um, but it may be that we have to change their idea of we're no longer going on hikes. We're no longer going on places where I can't always predict the terrain or the route. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, another question from someone who works in rescue we get a good number of senior dogs that will have anxiety related to the many changes they are going through. Any mm -hmm. tools for the transition through foster care to placement, particularly for new foster caregivers? Um, yes. So this is, um, this is, it's, I think that's some of the most heartbreaking anxiety that I deal with. A great example of this was recently a dog that was dropped off at my doorstep, 14 years old, lived with the same person in the same home, but they, for the majority of dogs that I take in, um, in my rescue and sanctuary, the, the older dogs that are owner surrenders are just, they're too inconvenient. Now they, they're soiling the house. They don't want to deal with that. And so they bring these dogs to me and watching the anxiety that that dog, that senior dog goes through is absolutely heartbreaking. And it's very, very much a, um, position where it puts me in a position where I, I feel like a lot of times then that dog, I'm like, this is sink or swim. You are either going to adjust and go through this transition and we'll be okay. Or I'm not going to let you continue to feel this level of anxiety. I, like it's, it's not fair when they stop eating and they're pacing and it lasts for months and months. Um, an example of this was, I did have one that had such bad anxiety. He was breaking through windows um, to try to get out. Cause he just had no idea. And then I have some that are, that do okay. My main recommendation is to go slow, so slow. Do not give them just because they're they are older and they seem fine the entire house. Um, give them a small space that they can find very predictable and they know. Then slowly increase that if you want to. Make sure that um, food and water, honestly, for me, I leave it down all the time because as for senior dogs, their, their digestive system and it tends to be changing all the time. That's something I've spoken about quite frequently in other workshops is changing. We have to be familiar with like, sometimes my senior dogs eat at 10 o'clock at night. They don't eat at six o'clock anymore. Their dietary needs might change. So giving them access to that stuff as, as much as you can. Um, and just being a source of comfort and support and letting them take that if they want it, but leave it if they don't. 
Um, some of them want it. And some of them are like, I don't want anything to do with you. And I say, that's okay. I'm still just going to sit here and read a book next to you. And when you're ready, you'll snuggle up to me. And when you're not, that's okay. I'm just still going to be here for you. So predictability, going slow. Um, and I do think for some of them having a buddy, another senior dog. Um, I'm a, I think that my senior gang is always like, oh, hey, you know, let's shuffle out into the yard to poop together. And then let's shuffle back in for our tapioca. You know, like they just, they sort of take everybody under their wing and that helps. Um, so I do think that sometimes looking in rescues for fosters who also have other seniors can help if the dog is in that same, um, it can, can handle that kind of thing that can help. I love that we've had such a span of questions from these are great to dog owners and everything in between. So I think we have just probably one more question um, about creating a positive association with grooming activities in seniors that aren't used to being handled, especially yeah. things like brushing their teeth, eye drops or nail trims. Mm. Um, okay, so positive association with uh, with handling and sort of that sort of cooperative care. I mean, my my favorite thing that I use for all my senior dogs is baby food, plain chicken baby food, probably one of the best things that you can use um, on a metal spoon. Um, and you can put it on a spoon, you can also freeze it, you can keep it in the fridge and the dog can lick it right from the jar. Um, I will do that in combination with doing some brushing or I'll hold it while I do a little bit of eye, eye drops. Um, but what also has to happen if you have a dog that has chronic medical condition where eyes or eardrops or, um, you know, the tooth is going to need to be looked at or that kind of thing is doing the actual act multiple times without actually doing the act, if that makes sense. So, you know, getting the dog used to, you know, my husband loves me because I'm like, let's put him on the kitchen counter to do this stuff. But getting the dog used to like, I'm going to put you up on the kitchen counter. I'm going to give you a bunch of baby food while I just wave the droppers over your eyes. And then I'm putting you back down on the ground and I, nothing actually bad or stingy kind of happened. If the only only time you're doing it is when something actually is going to have to happen or you're going to have to manhandle that animal. They're going to very quickly get on guard and it's going to get ugly very quickly. So um, lots of diluting it, so to speak, going slow and pick your battles. So if, if I have a dog that has really, really bad teeth, I would rather the dog go to the vet have a full dental, have them clean the teeth and let me focus on treating the eyes versus no, I'm going to do your eyes. I'm going to do your ears and I'm going to do your teeth and I'm going to trim your nails. Like pick your battles for some of these dogs. Let them get some of that really intense care done, potentially under anesthesia through a vet with someone else that can be the bad guy. So I can spend time building a relationship with that animal um, without pushing them over threshold and ruining it for the two of us. When you said about um, not always doing the, what you're planning to do, but just kind of associating them with the dropper or whatever, one of our commenters on Facebook said they do that with the vet. So they'll do a drive-by of the vet's office, or yep. if it's not busy, they'll take the dog just into the lobby of the vet, or they'll let a, an associate pet the dog and then they'll leave or something like that. And it's helped their dog a lot with the negative association that the vet is scary and it's a place I only go once a year or once every six months or something. That right. Just that white coat syndrome, right? Where right. the dog is like, I know that, I know that sound, I know that, you know, but there's so much access now to play stethoscopes and um, really, you know, all this stuff that we can be doing at home to prepare our dogs. So it isn't that scary, but absolutely the hardest part post COVID pre COVID post COVID now is how busy vets are that a lot of them will struggle with having the availability. Some vets still do. Um, a lot of these larger clinics still have that, but some don't. So, um, you know, working with your vet and saying, well, what are some predictable things that I can absolutely make sure I'm working on at home. So when he comes for the visit, do you, have a raised table. Okay. I got to get a raised table at home, like a grooming table and work on getting my dog on and off of that. And maybe I can even bring something similar that I'm using at home to the vet's appointment. So it will translate, um, and working through that as much as you can. That's a great point. Yeah. Those are all fantastic suggestions. I, I'm thinking of my own experience and the, that's all very helpful. Um, Jim, I think that was our last question. If you want to um, sign us off. 
I would love to. Yeah, I want to thank um, Helen just for your time and expertise today. I know it's just really, really um, valuable, some great information. I know there's even more questions I was writing down as we were going through and answering your the, the questions you were answering brings up more questions. So um, we look forward to having you back. Um, and I'd like to thank all the attendees and, and the members or that have uh, watched our webinar just for taking the time of their day um, to really learn what they can do to take care of their dogs. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for what you do for your dogs. It's to spend that time to do that. Um, it's, it's important um, and it's appreciated by so many people. Um, and thank Laura and Amanda for hosting this, uh, um, this webinar. This is my first time hosting, so hopefully it went well. Um, I look forward to doing it again. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I just wanna hope everyone has a great rest of their day um, and be well. Thank you.